Like the main part. No. no. Got the pig. I want to hear all about the pig. Tell me about the he pig. He was a lovely little baby pig with a big snout and beautiful eyes, and we raised him from a little baby. What was his name again? We called him Wilbur. Yeah. Yeah. Did you think of him as your child? Pretty much. But then how did yes. you feel when you slaughtered him? Well, I thought that, you know, just like my children, I can get so irritated to the point where they just... <laughs> did it just did you just have a bad day with it? And you said, I, so it's I had a bad day and I said, you know what, you're on the grill tonight. <laughs> I can't even throw my eyes. Oh, okay. 
British accent. <laughs> just how many times have, have you said to someone, I just didn't get around to it? Look at all that good food. Probably. That's what I thought. See? I'm telling you, I got that. 
I did have to double check though when I was working on my corner this morning. Which way? Particularly when you're putting them on. Go back. Just, yeah. Oh, you should. And they have the little portholes and the bathrooms are itty bitty and kind of crooked. Just like they should be. Just like they should be. And we eat on the boat, we do everything, and we walk around, and you can go in a lot of the areas and read about the history. Oh, you know, it's fun. Well, you'll have plenty of time to walk around the ship, though. Yeah. Spread over. I mean, it used to be so Right, so this is there, it's nice and represent. Oh, you've got plenty of desserts. Do you want me to put this in the fridge or? Just now, it's just a small honey. Okay, so I passed out a small one, so I told you that if you came, we'd get you some. Did you use it? At what point and why? Well, as soon as he gets his real armor. Yeah. Okay. Do you have to have me? I don't know. I don't know. Backyard. Backyard, yes. Okay. They're going to be doing a joust? Well, that one's a much good text in me. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did, I did, I did, I did, I did, um, London oh, oh, I think that's the only one I put in the, the, the memory. Oh, oh, in the blue shirt. This is, this is lovely. Who, who made the, who, who made all the stuff? Oh, yeah. No, I am. Yeah, I, I think it's designed for that. 
same with that Raven's Peak. I mean, it's going to go through a lot of stuff. Like, you know, the body on the leg. Yeah, I maybe mean, falling a heck out of the armor, but I'm not sure. If you're... Sure. Yeah. How about Thrust? Raven's Peak? I think kind of same thing with thrusts. Okay. Not, like, not the breastplate, because it's going to glance, and okay. unless it's to the eye slot area, it's going to glance. Okay, all right. Okay, still say that. feet counts the same as a thrust? I would say yeah. Okay. Easy work. You dress like that all the time? I'm doing this. Yeah. I'm just saying that they work. Actually, I, I am trying to train myself by like jogging in a chain shirt and such. Uh, mainly because yeah, you have to get used to wearing the weight and doing aerobic exercise. Because what we're doing is really just very aerobic exercise. Um, a lot of kind of slow, bur fast bursts of strength, and then kind of waiting and another fast burst. Uh, we're each carrying about 60 pounds on us when we're fighting. Um, so it's a it's a pretty big addition. You definitely need to get used to it to be able to do it well. Yeah. How often do you guys get together and spar? Uh, we do a demo like this at least about once a month. Uh, we try to do sparring maybe at least twice a month or so if it's a slow month. Um, so, n not like every day, uh, and we prefer to get it something like every week, but life gets in the way sometimes, so, so it's not always easy to get everything going. Is that your suit? Uh, so a lot of this actually does belong to him, because he's the old guy with money, and I'm the young guy who he wants to beat up on. So he puts me in armor so he can hit me. <laughs> Armor and sword fight, so I don't complain. 
Uh, so actually something kind of kind of what was that? Is it as hard to imagine by the way in like get our cars back and we're all like stuff? Yeah. Yeah, when you're actually a knight on a horse. I don't do any equestrian. Oh no, we're I'm not really all that familiar with horses. But certainly when you add a two thousand pound animal in the mix, things get even more intense. Yeah. That's kind of yes. But uh Something you may have noticed some of the stuff we were doing. One thing that we weren't doing much of was just swinging and bashing each other. The reason being, I can swing. Not going to do much. Granted, that wasn't a terribly hard swing, but even if I swung as hard as I could, it'll dent his armor a little bit. But, oh, yeah. We have some demonstration piece. So I might dent his armor with this one a little bit. I'm never going to cut through it. Never. So what we have here is a helmet that we've done some experiments on, some experimental cutting. Um, if you want to take a look at it a little bit later, all, all of the strikes that we made to the helmet are labeled. Here's a nice two-handed sword thrust. You can kind of see a little bit of the dent so here and, and a scratch. Coming through like yeah. that. I, I'm sorry, it was strike. Or strike. Yeah. Okay. So one of these big old, old, yeah, big old two-handed strike. Your hands. Little dent there. Certainly sent the helm rolling across my lawn, but would not have absolutely not have done much damage to the person inside. I have dents in my helmet bigger than this. I've never had to stop fighting for any reason. So um, yeah, like Kyle says, chopping a big old strike at a good solid piece of armor is much more likely to break the sword than it is to break the helmet. This is a fun one on this other side. We have the one-handed broadsword strike. This little dent right there. There's a note under it. Broken sword. Yeah. He shattered yeah. the handle of the sword yeah. when he hit the helmet. Right. M swords, medieval swords were notoriously fragile. Chronicles talk about them breaking in the middle of battle all the time. Um, and that's exactly the sort of thing that you don't want to do with a sword, is swing it at a big solid object as hard as you can. The art of sword fighting, especially someone in armor like this, find a place where they are lightly armored or unarmored. Attack places like the armpit, inside the elbow, at the neck, in the eyes, behind the knee. Getting to those spots is much more effective than, like Kyle says, just blasting at that great big thick piece of armor that you are never going to cut through. And so, oh, sure, yeah. the way that we were doing this, yeah. the way that we would look for those targets, obviously we can't really do that with a lot of finesse with all this bulky armor on, waving a sword around. So we went to a position called half sword, which is when you take your left hand and put it up on the blade. So see, a lot of what we were doing was starting from here, starting from here, or sometimes the other way around. We weren't trying to whack each other, it just, just doesn't work. But with the sword here, now I have a really solid thrust that I can make, and I can also do a number of different grappling techniques to either disarm my opponent, throw him onto the ground and get in an advantageous position, uh, or get through his armor. So, really, a, an armored sword fight doesn't begin like this for the most part. Generally, it begins like this, a tech, in a position called the Brent Shearn, or the Fire Poker Guard. From here, you can see that Kyle has a real good angle at a great spot to attack me, the armpit. Right? That's a really solid and valuable attack to be able to get in. So this is a good starting position for a sword fight. I'm threatening him, he's threatening me. Like he says, we have a lot of options. Thrusts with the sword, moving into grapple. This is a really strong armored sword fighting position. demonstrate one kind of thing. Okay. So, one potential technique, uh, essentially a, a grappling disarm. Actually, uh, so let me, let me start with this. Just so actually, let, let me start with an introduction since we have a crowd here now. <laughs> Hi there, everyone. Hello. My name is Scott, uh, and I'm. we are here tonight with Chivalry Today, the Chivalry Today educational program, to do a little bit of a demonstration of uh, armored medieval sword fighting, as they would have done in England in the 14th and 15th centuries. Um, um, we came down, kind of met, uh, met with Fran in the House of England a few months ago when we did a demonstration for uh, one of the local charter school groups. Fran uh, and, and the crew here was, like, uh, was uh, generous enough to let us use the House of England uh, for the kids. Uh, 
come out here and do one of these sword fighting demos, and we thought it'd be fun to do it for you this evening since we have such a nice evening out here on the lawn. Uh, these are my assistants, Kyle, Hello. April, Jennifer, Dave, Hans, Hans, who is our resident authentic Englishman. <laughs> Listen for his accent. It's Great. awesome. Um, so anyway, we're out here tonight to talk to you a little bit about medieval sword fighting and put on a little demonstration for your enjoyment. Okay, so um, one of the things that we talk about when we give a demonstration of sword combat is the fact that when training with these swords, um, medieval knights trained for sort of a spectrum of techniques. There are manuals written in the 14th and 15th century about how they trained with their swords to fight in armor, out of armor, uh, in games and tournaments, in duels and battles. And one of the things that the book says is that a knight should train to use his sword in earnest and in play. So in earnest, in a duel, in a battle, in war, when things are deadly serious, but also in play, in games, in tournaments, uh, in sparring matches, when it was a friendly match and to hurt somebody was not the goal of the encounter. So they sort of had a range of techniques that they would use with their swords, and they knew that it was not appropriate to use deadly force techniques in a game, and they knew that it was not appropriate to use games and, and sporting techniques in a battle. They recognized the difference between the two. Yes, back there, young sir, you have a question? Say again. His name is Jay. His name is Jay. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> so Kyle and I are going to show you a little bit of a demonstration of how this, how this sort of spectrum of techniques would have played out. Some different techniques that might have been used in games and tournaments, in a non-lethal situation, and in a, in a battle in a lethal situation. So let's start out. Okay, all right. So let's start out, for example, with uh, in, a, in a tournament or, or a sparring kind of situation. Again, in, in one of the misconceptions that we often have, if you've been to medieval times restaurants or seen <coughs> uh, movies where there's a, a, a tournament, a jousting tournament, you get the impression that the goal of this game was to kill the other person. And it was okay, everybody, when somebody died, everybody stood up and cheered. Well, not really. In fact, they had a word for it. If someone was killed in a tournament, they called it murder. And someone would get charged with murder if in fact there was found to be intent. They recognized, hey, this is a dangerous game. We are swinging swords at each other. Boys will be boys. If it was just sort of oops, an accident, uh, they would call it mischance and everybody would move on. But if there was intent behind it, someone might be charged with murder. So. In a tournament, in a game kind of situation, what they would have trained for to be maybe to use a technique, something like this. Okay, Mr. Kyle and I are going to come together to the bind. Like this, enveloping the arms, right? Kyle hasn't killed me. Kyle has not completely trapped me. In fact, the, the manual show the counter to this technique. We're ready to go. But just for a moment, there we go. Just for a moment, if you were judging a tournament, and they often had judges for this, the judges of this tournament might say, ah, Kyle got through his defense, put him in a compromised position, point to Kyle there. Nicely done. Okay? Good. So that would be the kind of technique that they would have used in a game, in a tournament. Right? In a... Come here, Brigham. <laughs> in a different kind of... Do we have a Pardon? stick? Oh, I do, wait, 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 do have, a, have a stick. This is awesome. So, let's imagine a different encounter. I, it's okay, I'm a skeptic. Okay. Let's imagine a different encounter. <laughs> Kyle's walking along the road and comes upon a brigand on the road. Ha! Who says? Your money or your life. <laughs> okay. So, in this situation, Kyle, our knight here, is not terribly threatened by this brigand. A guy with a big stick is not really going to threaten a knight whether he's in armor or not. This knight has a lot of training, he has a sword. He doesn't really have to worry about this too much. He can pretty much just turn his back on this brigand and walk away. But part of a knight's job is to make the, the world a safer place for everyone. And so Kyle doesn't necessarily want this brigand to jump the next person coming along this road. So he might have to take care of this guy in a way that's appropriate to the situation. 
He can't just lop off his head. It's not a very chivalrous thing to do for a knight who's supposed to dispense justice. Uh, believe it or not, even back in the bad old days of the Middle Ages, everyone was guaranteed a trial by jury. That is not a jury. Okay. So, Kyle might need to use a less than lethal, um, a less than lethal technique to take this bandit into captivity and have him stand trial. Now, our friend Dave here has a little bit of a bum arm, so I'm going to step in for him and play the part Can of I be the, the bandit? Brady. Can you be the what? He's going to take you to the ground. <laughs> not, in your not in my pretty dress. Do it to me, it'll be easier to see. <laughs> hey! What, this is what you want? Okay. Huh? Good. All right. So in this case, Kyle might use, uh, against this brigand with his quarter staff, Kyle might use a technique more like this. Okay? Okay. So in this instance, I still haven't killed him, right? He's alive. But there's really nothing he can do to get out of this. If I keep pressing into him, I'm going to dislocate his shoulder or break his wrist. I've got him trapped in here pretty securely. So that's the kind of situation where all he can really do at that point is yield, and I can take him into the court to face justice. Because once again, just because he's a brigand trying to rob me doesn't mean I should just kill him. We need to figure out, okay, is this something, is he just a hardened criminal and he kills people on the road and takes their money every day? Or is he just a starving father with three kids back at home who's you know, turning to crime at the last moment just to try to get food for his kids? That's an instance where you probably wouldn't want to be killing this person. Right. Even knights recognized there was a certain sense of prudence that needed to go along with that sense of justice. That too, prudence, was part of the ideals of chivalry. Uh, you want to do the other one for me? So yeah, we'll move on. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> so on the battlefield, defending home and country, we might move on to a more serious technique. In a situation of a battle, for those of you who are watching us earlier in our duel, you might see a technique looks a little bit more like this. Okay? And really, I'm being pretty nice here because really this technique ends with this. So, I'll be a little bit nice to Kyle, however. Obviously, you can see, if Kyle has a helmet on or not, this is likely to end very quickly, right? Unless Kyle says, Yield. Okay, very good opportunity to show the ideals of chivalry, accepting someone's honorable surrender, part of the ideals of chivalry, allow them to rise again. So we still get the, the concept that even today in our modern military, a show of a truce or surrender, a white flag, somebody who's a non-combatant or surrendered, we don't attack people like that. The laws of war from today come right from these ideals of chivalry. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a, a practical demonstration of this. We're going to do for you this evening our demonstration that we call our deed of arms. A deed of arms was not quite a duel, not quite a tournament. It's a kind of event that might have, and often did occur, when two warring armies came together and the ambassadors, the, uh, the, the negotiators, the heralds came together and worked out a peace, a truce. There's gonna be no fighting today. Well, that's great, except there's a few thousand knights here who have come to show their skill, their prowess to show before the lords and ladies assembled, who are perhaps even commanding this army, that we might be someone that they would want to have in their retinue, in their service. We want a chance to show our skill. And so a deed of arms might have been called to allow these knights, both young and experienced, to show their skill before a panel of judges. So that's kind of what we're going to do for you here this evening. Uh, both with our long swords and with our pole axes, both of which were considered to be very knightly weapons, put on a demonstration of skill with. Um, in this, in this case, what we're going to do is well, so first of all, recognizing the way we use these swords. So let me give a quick demonstration of why. Oh sure, hey, we have that. We, we have this. this. All right. So. Often, you will see, again at medieval times or Renaissance fair, you'll see knights 
battling with steel swords and as if yep. as if it was perfectly safe. Well, it is perfectly safe in choreographed combat and stage combat. And don't get me wrong, good stage combat is quite an art unto itself. However, even a blunted sword is a pretty dangerous weapon. So Kyle, I'm gonna let Kyle do this. <laughs> Kyle's gonna give us a good demonstration on this target that is a pretty good approximation of human flesh, of why this sword, uh, even when it's blunted, is a pretty effective weapon. So once again, this is not a sharp sword. I can run my hand all up and down it. it won't cut me at all. Oh, wow. Okay. So you'll notice I did not rear back. I didn't swing for the fences and hack through everything. From straight up to straight forward. Clean slice straight through the cabbage. Let's see. How about for the tip? Again, this tip, not razor sharp. I can push against it pretty hard. It's rounded over. I'm not bleeding. Straight through the cabbage entirely. It is actually not a misconception that it's difficult to get something off your blade once you've stabbed it. You can tug on a cabbage all day long and it'll hardly move. So this is why even with a blunt sword, if we are using realistic techniques, as we have trained to do, if we're using realistic techniques meant to defeat somebody in armor, even a blunt sword is extremely dangerous, okay? So we're gonna do exactly the same thing that they would have done in the Middle Ages. We're gonna swap out our steel swords for what they would have called wasters. Plastic, uh, plastic swords in the Middle Ages, they would have been made out of, out of hardwood, out of oak or hickory. Ours are made out of polymer, so they stand up to the abuse. Relatively safe. I say relatively because we are still essentially swinging baseball bats at each other. So, believe me, these are not completely safe. Once in a while, we do come away with a little bit of blood from one of these demonstrations. Uh, but um, in general, we can use these both to strike and thrust with, with relative safety in techniques that with a steel sword would defeat the armor and hurt the person inside. Clear enough? Good. Okay, so what we're going to do here uh, is a demonstration of these sort of techniques that you would see in a deed of arms. As I said, the deed of arms was done in front of a panel of judges, lords and ladies, knights, uh, knights who had come to see the skill and prowess of these knights who were putting on their display of, of, of arms, this deed of arms. It was judged in a pretty interesting way. So first, the, the first scoring is done with what we call counted blows. The striking of a blow good. is gonna be indicated as a good blow. Right? The first one to strike three blows will bring an end to the fight. So three blows brings an end to the fight. But in a deed of arms, not all blows are created equal. Okay? We're also going to have two other criteria that you all are going to help us judge. Skill and chivalry. Okay? So simply striking three blows is not necessarily a great show of skill. Here's a good demonstration of why. Kyle can strike me in the foot one, two, three times. Good, good, good. Three good blows? Yes, no. Ab absolutely. A, a sword through my foot is not going to make my day any better. But there's a problem with this. In this case, it's a little bit of a trick shot. Kyle is thrusting at his opponent's foot. He's not putting himself really in any danger to do that. And it's a trick shot that if his next opponent has armor on his foot, is not going to work very well. This thing's okay. called sabatons. Yes. Armor goes right over the foot. So in this case, absolutely three valid blows, but maybe not a great show of skill. Better show of skill might be, again, if we come together and I can get through Kyle's defense. Good. Okay. A better show of skill. I had to get through his defense. I had to get his sword out of the way. I had to put myself in danger and defend myself. An okay show of skill, but what's the problem with this? Anybody see? Well, I'm, I'm open potentially. What's that? He's not. He's not. And why not? Because I, I got through his defense and I struck at the best piece of armor he possibly has. The thickest piece of armor given the chance to 
strike at a vulnerable target, I chose to strike at the armor. Better show of skill, but not a great one. Better than that, even, might be something like this. Coming together and thrusting up at the arm. That, with a real sword, would absolutely put an end to the fight. So, one blow like that, in terms of skill, might be far better than three strikes to the toe. So again, you guys and girls are going to help us, demonstrate, help us choose, after our three counted blows, which of the fighters showed a better, a better sense of skill? It might not be the person that struck three blows. Often this is what we find, that the person who wins on points is not necessarily the most skillful. Finally, we're gonna ask for a show of hands about chivalry. This one's a little bit hard, because chivalry does not mean that we're both gonna stand out here with our white hankies and say, after you, sir. No, after you, right? As part of the ideals of chivalry, when we come out here to a, a duel, a tournament, a deed of arms, we are both bringing our best game out onto the field, doing our best to win. So, uh, for, so for, uh, again, for a show of chivalry, let's talk about something like this. Kyle and I come together. Good. I get here. Should I hit him now? Is this a chivalrous thing to do? Uh, no. Can I come in the back? <laughs> Why not? No, it's not like I didn't know he was there. He can get you. We are, we are in a sword fight. I didn't jump out of a dark alley and bushwhack Kyle from behind. It took a lot of skill to get in this position. This is a place where I might. Good. Okay. What's probably not really chivalrous is this, this. One strike, allow him to regain his defense and continue again. That's a chivalrous thing to do. Other signs of chivalry might, would certainly be acknowledging blows when they are landed, telling my opponent, for example, if I strike in your side, if I strike here, good. is that a good blow? Flat part of the sword, right? So that would be a place where I would say, Kyle, nope, don't take that. That was with the flat of the sword. It wouldn't have done any damage at all, okay? All right. My assistants are going to kind of give you guys a little coaching as we go along to explain what's going on. But just understand what we're doing here. There are no good guys and bad guys. This is not a show. This is not a choreographed demonstration. This is a real, a real demonstration of skill. We don't know who's going to win this ahead of time. We are both doing our best to win. But we both take that concept of chivalry very seriously. Okay? So you're probably not going to see any insulting or trash talking or boasting out on the field. So that uh, choosing that most chivalrous warrior is sometimes kind of difficult. The other thing you want to remember is that just because you chose one person, that doesn't mean the other person is not chivalrous. Sometimes that's difficult. You want to choose one over the other. We all recognize that in a given fight, one person might have a greater opportunity to show chivalry than in another. So in any given fight, we're going to ask for a vote. Just understand that it's okay to say, well, in this one fight, he was more chivalrous. You're not saying, oh, you're not a chivalrous person. It's just so for that one fight. Don't worry, you're not going to hurt our feelings. No. Oh, <laughs> we might try. If you start calling me names. Okay. Then I might cry. Okay. <laughs> Actually, you know, we might be insanely um, sexist here, and let the gentlemen vote for skill and the ladies vote for chivalry, and point out that the chivalry point was really the one that mattered. Okay. It's very medieval. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So what he, what he suggested was, although by modern standards, it's a tad sexist, um, medievally, traditionally, women chose the most chivalrous because it was a more difficult decision and it counted for more. So women at tournaments actually had the greater influence on judging. It was one of the ways that the code of chivalry actually did begin, just begin, but begin to make women's opinions more important than they had been before. Which is not to say women had equal rights in the Middle Ages. We all know that's not true. <laughs> However, there is an advantage to that. Now, don't forget that we know there's no good guy, we know there's no bad guy, 
but they love it if you sort of cheer if you see something good. So don't be shy about letting them know if you think something looked good. Ready? Play up. Bravo. pointed out, or Kyle pointed out, that he had gotten a thrust as well. So one each. Nice call, Kyle. That's a perfect oh, 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 oh. Bravo. <laughs> Two on the O. Tries to the leg. Mistimed it. One vote. Everybody has to vote. So Wait, Kyle for chivalry. 
Okay, got one, oh, two, three. Okay, get on for chivalry. Yeah, but people better be voting or I'm gonna call on you. Okay, so Guillaume got it for chivalry. So, ladies, what do you? Uh, can you give me a reason? Something that you saw that made you feel like he was being particularly chivalrous? The other night went for his legs. Went for his knee. That's true. Went for his knee. Went for his knee. Yeah. Grabbed at it. Yeah. I think you may be. I think, I think you, you may, may be, be mistaking your role, okay. ladies. For <laughs> <laughs> knee. Uh, you. That was he going for his knees. Okay. Okay. Then swap every. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it makes a good point. It is once we get these helmets on, it is hard to tell who is who in all this. And keep track of in the middle of a fight what's happening. And then yeah. go for still the shrivelry like we need instant replay. It's true. <laughs> okay, well I'll tell you what, let's have an instant replay. Let's try it again. Okay. Okay. Sure. So remember we're gonna ask you the same questions again, so pay attention. Oh. We'll switch over into the fight with full axes now. Lena showing you the oh my God. real yes. instance of what this would look like. <laughs> Again, this is why we cannot do this with the real thing. Right. Yes. It's deadly. So, Ooh, basically an ice pick, yeah. ice pick point. Axe blade. Hammer. Hammer can crush and bend armor, make it not work so well. Okay. You Some, sometimes they would have a, a spike or a beak on the back end instead, instead of, the of that. So this would be the, the raven's beak. Yeah. The other thing is, don't forget, getting hit hard with a steel-capped piece of wood is enough to knock anybody off their stride and can do damage as well. That's called the cube. And the whole thing can be used very much like a quarter staff as a grappling and wrestling device, okay? So paying attention now for skill and chivalry. That's right. That's right. Gonna ask for votes again. Okay. Remember, feather guy, gold guy, okay? Or <laughs> <laughs> she says like a really guy. fair comparison. Well, I personally think you got the pretty bow. You put me in this armor. <laughs> Alright, All right, gentlemen. Lay on. Okay. Nice call. Chivalry um, class called that not good because it hit there, which not as a bad face. I can't tell the There was a hat. You all can't tell. Nope. Yeah. 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 Really was. Nice call. Yeah. 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 No point. Not enough power on your Oh, that was good. good. Yeah, that was good on thrust on his face.
Oh, no. thrust under the chin. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thrust under the chin. Huh? Are you bleeding? Check his chin. Oh, yeah, you're bleeding. Whatever. Oh, no, he's not. Never mind. No. It's okay. just red okay. stuff. No blood. Oh, no. Nice. Really? Yeah. I think it just caught the edge there. Right. Okay. All right. Nice call. Kyle said, no, that was the outside of your elbow, not the inside of your elbow. One off. Good. <laughs> Two on Kyle. One right across eye slot. Yeah, good. Good. That's victory. Victory to Gillum because that was two on Kyle, or three on Kyle and two on Gillum. But you can tell that last one was simultaneous shot. Wow. Okay, so one last chance to vote here. So for skill in the last sword fight, how many are voting for Feather Guy? Kyle. Man of voting! Okay, how about the skill, the gold guy? I need a few more. Okay. 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 Just that most of the men left, I know. Okay. How about chivalry for Kyle? Okay. You'll, yeah, you'll notice, point out, several times in there, yep. I was going to take a blow. And he said, All Kyle had to do was keep his mouth shut, and he would get a point. Twice at least, he, he said, I am not satisfied with that blow. Please do not score it. Told me not to take a blow that I was going to take. Very chivalrous and honorable thing to do. Okay. Good. Okay, we got some. What? Nobody's voting. I voted for Kyle. You did, okay, yes. No, actually that vote, as few people as were voting, it went to Kyle. Okay. Which rightfully it should have. Because he was, there were several of those. <laughs> Gentlemen, the best part about this game is there's friends. We could not do this if we did not have complete trust in one another. We are, we are quite literally putting our lives in each other's hands when we do this. Even though these are safety weapons, we're, we're hitting each other with all the power that we have, we're throwing each other to the ground, we're doing things that could easily wind up twisting a joint, breaking a neck, if we do not have complete and utter respect and trust for each other. Just like in any real martial art. Okay. One last thought that I'd like to leave you all with is a quick reality check that we end our talks with. Looking back into history, did every knight in England in the Middle Ages live by the code of chivalry? Absolutely not. Historical chronicles are filled with accounts of knights who were, who were selfish, who were vain, who were cowardly, who were corrupt, who were greedy. But that doesn't mean that chivalry didn't exist. Knights in the 13th and 14th centuries wrote very sincerely and passionately about the importance of living by a code of honor, about the importance of chivalry in a stable and safe society. Just because not everybody lived up to the ideals of chivalry doesn't mean it didn't exist. Similarly to our ideals today, we can look around us and see corruption and wrongdoing and injustice, but that doesn't mean that we don't have a code of honor, a code of ethics that we all try to follow. Sometimes, like those medieval knights, we find that we are just human beings and we fall a little bit short of our ideals. But following a code means that tomorrow we can try again. We can try just a little bit harder to reach for those ideals that we strive for every day uh, and, and work towards them just like the medieval knights did towards the ideals of chivalry. Thank you very much for your attention. Again, we are with the Chivalry Today Educational Program. If you would like, if you would like to grab some flyers for our school education program, or please come and visit our website. We have over 300 articles about the ideals of chivalry, both in history and in the modern world. Please grab a flyer. Also, you may not be aware, but coming up in October, we have a real world-class event that goes on here in, in San Diego, in Poway, 
There is the only competitive jousting match in the United States that is sanctioned by the Royal Armories of England it takes place in Poway in October. It is a wonderful event. I invite you all to come out to that. We have flyers for that as well. Again, thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure working with you. If any of you has any ideas, I, I, questions, or would like to come up and check out some of the armor, please come on up. We'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you all. There's words in there somewhere trying to come out. <laughs>